Northrop and Johnson go to space. Jeff Bezos' super yacht is spotted on its first sea trial. Crazy critters from the deep. And an inside look at a Navy veteran couple's pleasure boating preferences. Stay tuned. Welcome to From the Helm Boating Broadcast with Marine Max, bringing you the latest news and notes in the world of boats. Welcome to From the Helm Boating Broadcast, your source for news and notes in the world of boats. This show is presented by Marine Max, the world's largest lifestyle retailer of recreational boats and yachts. And together we are all united by water. Subscribe, follow, and hit that five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform. Keep up to date with all the latest and greatest in the boating industry. Let's get into today's Boat of the Month. First up is the Cruiser's Yachts Canius 46, and you'll see why as we get into our interview. Clocking in at 14 feet 11 inches with a beam of 14.9, the Cruiser's Yachts 46 Canius is a perfect blend of elegance and practicality. Great boat to check out, as you'll hear our uh, expert in today's Canteus boat ownership experience is a Navy veteran and his wife, and they have a lot of good things to say about the practicality and use of the 46. All right, and we're moving on to headlines. In case you missed it, here's what's happening in the marine industry. Northrop & Johnson partnered with Space Perspective. So we are going to space, y'all. They recently announced a strategic partnership with Space Perspective, the world's only carbon neutral space travel company, unlocking exclusive access to a transformative journey to space for select clients. The collaboration will take their already stellar roster of experience and luxury client exclusives to literally the next frontier, space. Very, very cool things. I can't believe we are here, 2023. We are going to space. They expect the plan to be open to sell tickets by 2024. So if you're interested, follow Northrop & Johnson for more. You may be able to book your ticket and uh, check out what space has to offer. Next up, we've been following this journey for quite a few months. Uh, Jeff Bezos's $500 million super yacht has been spotted on its first day of sea trials. Uh, previous episodes of Boating Broadcast brought to you by us, Marine Max. We've covered a little bit of the story of Bezos's yacht. There's been a little bit of drama about where he had it built and the town and dismantling a bridge and finding ways around it. So he's had quite a, uh, you know, experience building this yacht, but it is 127 meters. So that's over 400 feet. It, the Y721 sailing yacht Koru has been spotted on its first day of trials in the North Sea. It left Rotterdam early in February, and it's estimated to have a $500 million price tag. And it's the largest sailing yacht in the world. So very cool stuff. You can see more in this video of the yacht going for its sea trial. Last up, I saw this. I scroll the Instagrams. I know a lot of other people might not, but this is really great. So I follow this fun account. It's called The Hilarious Ted. He does a lot of cat videos, and I think they're hilarious. But this came up, and it stopped me in my tracks. So if you can't make it to space to explore, how about exploring our deep blue oceans? He goes through a series of photos of unidentified and identified species of, of fish and shark and marine life that I have never seen before. And some of them are quite terrifying, but it is really cool to look at and to know that these things exist. And there is a whole unexplored world that's right here on our world. Highly recommend given the hilarious how to follow. Now we are going to hear more about that Cruiser's Yachts 46 Canius, among others, including Sea Rain Galleon. It's the Zerfi family, Marine Max customers for the last 22 years. And with their Navy background and affinity for leisure boating, these two know a lot about navigating the Eastern seaboard. Good to oh. meet you guys. Well, thank you both so much for joining me. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary, so we wanted to highlight some of the cool boating stories, just the cool people we know, like yourselves. Well, obviously, it's Eric, Sabrina, Zerpy. We're husband and wife. We um, met, as I said, we met at the Naval Academy. And then when upon graduation, she was a service warfare officer. I was a nuclear submarine officer. And the, right around the time we graduated from the Naval Academy, my father started solar technology in the basement of his house by himself. Um, he dev developed and brought to market the very first solar-powered flashing arrow panel. And the company literally has grown from him in the basement by himself to where it is today with no outside capital whatsoever, all just complete reinvesting. Sabrina and I resigned our commissions in 1998 to come to the company and join 
my parents helped them build it. When we got here, it was my parents, about 10 employees. Mm -hmm. We had about 10 people. That was it. Wow. And we got up to, before the pandemic hit, we get up to about 130 people. We grew it from nothing to, like I said, um, about 130 employees. And it's a 60,000 square foot manufacturing facility. And that was all done with no invest outside investment whatsoever at all. So that was a long, a very, very long, painful, hard road. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's where boating comes in, right? You got to you work hard, play hard. Did your father, was he in the Navy as well? How'd you get into the Navy? No, my, um, the way I got into the Navy's Naval Academy is I did not want, to, I did not want to be beholden to my parents for them paying for my education. So I sought out a scholarship and I saw the Naval Academy. I'm like, well, if I go there, I'm on my own. Nobody can tell me what to do other than, you know, the, the Navy, yeah. obviously. So, yeah. so I made no bones about it. I mean, I went there for the, for the scholarship. And then, of course, you get a great training career, et cetera, et cetera. And my father was career Navy. And my grandfather, most, both of my grandfathers on my mother's and my father's side were also in the Navy. Um, so I had some long Navy traditions uh, as far as going to the getting into the Navy and going to the Naval Academy. And my oldest sister actually went to the Air Force Academy, which kind of got me interested in the academies. I decided to go to the Naval Academy versus Air Force. And then my youngest sister also went to the Air Force Academy. So I've got a lot of military actually now, you know, of my, then our you know daughter went to the Naval Academy as mm -hmm. well. Um, Married her husband, who was a classmate. And... Yeah. You know, so actually all of my parents, you know, nine grand children six of them are in the military now and the, all of them that are over 18 are in the military so I've got a big military tradition now we have actually we've had everyone in every branch of service now Army Navy Air Force Marine Corps Space Force so um wow so all of them. well thank your entire family for your service that is <laughs> incredible that is incredible mm -hmm. just to just to be able to name all the branches even the Space Force so I know I got a little bit of Eric's boating history, but Sabrina, did you grow up boating as well? No, I did not grow up boating. Like I said, my father was in the Navy, but, uh, you know, we, he was, uh, I have, I have um, three sisters. Um, and so, you know, with four children, obviously we didn't quite have the funds to do that, but what we did do a lot of is actually recreation RV. We had a, we had a motor home. Ah. So kind of similar kind of, kind of thing. The first boat you bought was together, correct? Well, yes, we were married for probably about four or five years. So he bought the first boat while I was on deployment. So this, this was, you know, he had this, a little bit of a habit of buying big capital purchases when I wasn't there. I had just come back, you know, from, I think it was Greece and Italy and, and uh, the, the, the ship had come back and, you know, I pulled back in and he's bought a boat, you know, and, and at this time, actually, I was living in Norfolk. The, the ship was his home ported out of Norfolk. It actually was considered a continuously forward deployed. So you really didn't have any place to live. You lived on the ship because it was underway so much. So, wow. but it had pulled in after this deployment into Norfolk. He was still in Charleston. And so for that summer, I would go down, I would basically drive from Norfolk to Charleston on the weekends. And I think that was the three months that we had it. We, you know, it's funny, you know, we put over 200 hours, I guess, on that little boat. We did a lot of skiing down in Charleston, you know, because Charleston, I don't know if you're familiar with that. They call it the low country. It's a lot of tidal rivers, right? And so it, like a well, lot of- The Ash, the Cooper, and the Wando. Right. The three rivers that that join up and, and you know, we just, you know, a lot of little, little places to go water skiing. Mm -hmm. So we had a ball, you know, we didn't have kids then. We- uh, in fact, I think that's where we conceived our daughter, you know, was <laughs> little boat, right? But then, you know, he got that we were in the process of getting restationed anyway. I had moved up to Norfolk and he was down in Charleston and he had picked up a a new a job up in Norfolk. And so he then he brought this the the original Sea Ray up to Norfolk. And we found out in Norfolk there's not a lot of small boat boating. No. You know, so I mean we tried to go some places, but you know, Norfolk right at the mouth of the Chesapeake. It's just, it's all big. It's all big water. It's all big right. water. Yeah, there was yeah. not well, plus plus, she, plus she got pregnant and we're like, okay, we're not going to take a little baby out on a 20 foot cutty cab in the middle of the bay. So, so the first right. thing we bought was a bigger boat, right? So yeah, so we bought a, a 90, the first boat, I think I had the dates wrong. It was a 94 um, sea rate trailer boat, but then we immediately three months later traded that in on 95 formula F27 PC. Mm -hmm. So, and that was one tough, 
in around nine years, we put almost 700 hours on it. But that boat, when we had that in 97, we bought that in December or August of 94 and kept it all the way up through right before September 11th. Right. No, no 2000. 2000. Right. Because I remember we, we bought the 34 right after 9-11. Um, but that boat back in 90, the summer of 96, the summer of 97, we took that boat from Norfolk down to Charleston and back. No wow. GPS, no chart plotter, no nothing. <laughs> But we, we were naval officers. We thought we, you know, we thought we knew what we were doing, you know, when, and uh, it was grand, you know, it's very, intercoastal was actually very different back then. That's when, you know, they put a lot of bridges up over the intercoastal. I think there's only a couple now that you have to really worry about, but they used to have, I mean, it was. Remember the pontoon bridge? Yeah, they had a pontoon they bridge. They had this thing called a pontoon bridge. It literally looked like 55 gallon drums strapped together with boards across it. And when you wanted to go through the bridge, this guy comes out in a John boat. They untie it. He takes the John boat and pulls this bridge away. You go through and they put it back and tie it back up. But that was back in. And I think we were in the middle of a Marine Corps exercise at one point because we're running through the river. Yeah, well, keep in mind that's before weather.com and, you know, oh, uh, yeah. you necessarily know where you where you were, what you were, you know, before you had cell phones or anything, you know, so that right. was, that was. And then we also used to take that boat up when we get off of work in Norfolk, you know, on Friday, basically Friday evenings, four o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon, pack up the infant daughter, you know, run up the Chesapeake Bay up to Annapolis. When we leave the, we leave our Marine at six in the evening, we get to Annapolis at midnight. Wow. <laughs> and again, before, before weather.com and I, there's two, we ran yeah, and we had just the twice. enough fuel capacity on that boat to make it up there. Yeah, I would get it. That boat carried, I think, 107 gallons or something like that. It took us 95 to get there. And oh, gosh. one time we got caught in a thunderstorm and we burned so much fuel in the storm that we were pulling into the harbor and lost both engines at like one in the morning. We, twice we ran out of fuel. And another time something happened, we ran out of fuel. We got towed in at one o'clock in the morning by a sailboat, which was kind of embarrassing but uh, <laughs> but we, yeah, we used to do that with our infant daughter you know it's like it's uh, yeah I don't know how not not smart we were you know we thought oh well, we know what we're doing we're naval officers but you know you look back on it now and you're like oh my goodness what were you thinking you know again before cell phones and you oh, know there's no cell phones you know. it's that adventurous spirit you're like, yeah. <laughs> It's just called being young and dumb. It's kind of funny. I tell everybody experience and age is a, a double-edged sword. Now we've done so much and seen so much, we're half afraid to do much of anything. <laughs> <laughs> then we traded that in because then we moved up home. And then well, in Norfolk, we only lived 20 minutes from the boat. So you didn't spend every weekend, you know, I mean, that. Right. then we moved up to the Chesapeake Bay and we were going down for the full weekends because it's a two and a half hour drive. So we wanted something a little more bigger, a little more room. So we, and all we could afford at the time was a 34. So we bought, it was brand new. We bought a brand new 34 Sundancer, which was our first Marine Max boat, which we bought in 2000 at summer Summer's point. Summer's point. So we're, we go all the way back to Marine Max because since 2000. Yeah. So so we bought the 34 Dancer. So we only had that a season and a half. And then we traded on a 38 Sun Dancer, which was a wonderful boat. We had that for like nine years. That's basically the boat our daughter basically grew up on and remembers the most. Um, and that was classic. We went down every weekend during the summer, uh, every time. We kept that up in, uh, up in the Bohemia, Bohemia River. River. Up in the Bohemia River. Because it was a little bit closer to home. And then when our daughter got into just about the year or two before she was leaving to go to college, we wanted to upgrade. So then we traded that in on a 44 Sundancer, which was our first diesel powered boat. And we got that because at that time, that was right about when new boat prices were just getting ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so we bought the used 2008. And what was kind of funny about it is we really wanted a 45 sedan bridge, but the prices were insane. But then 18 months later, we basically were able to get a brand new 450 sedan bridge for about half of what they were originally selling for. Wow. Darn near close. So we saw it at the boat show and then you guys had two and we flew down to look at the one in Galveston, Texas. Yeah, so we, the, the one that we bought was down in Galveston, Texas. Yeah, we flew down to Galveston to look at mm -hmm. it, um, brought that up, but the, we, we kept that for four and a half years. So then we got rid of that and um, they convinced us to look at a galleon and we bought, it was a lot smaller. But it was a very good running boat. And um, so we said, okay, we'll take that. That's the one that we ran all the way to Key West and back. So we took yep. a little three galleon all the way down and back. We had that for three years, but then we were like, okay, we really miss our washer and dryer. We miss our grill. We miss this, that, and the other thing. We needed more. 
and we were waiting. And then there was just nothing available for a couple, I mean, literally nothing that was available that made any sense. Then we found out that Raymax bought cruisers. And I said to Sabrina, I said, that's interesting. I said, that's a really good deal because now they have a very vested interest in taking care of it. And then I was talking with RJ. I said, do you guys, I said, that 46 looks nice. He said, we have one. He said, in fact, we have the very first one on the bay. And I had gotten to the point where I talked to enough people and we had done enough trips up and down. I talked to enough people that people finally convinced me to give the Volvo pods a try. So we looked at the, at the cruisers and uh, it was great. And it's, this is a funny story too, because we were really on the fence with, with, if we really wanted to just do it that year or wait, we were going to wait. What, last year before 20, last? Last year for us, 2021. 2021. May of 2021. And we were really on the fence as to whether we want to just wait one more year till we another year or two till we weren't upside down in the other one, et cetera, et cetera. And I said to her, I said, you know what? I said, we better just pull the trigger on this. This is funny. I said to her, I said, I said, interest rates alone are going to make this thing a lot more expensive next year. I said, if we wait one year, this thing's going to cost us a lot more. I said, the interest rates alone are going to go up. So we decided to do it. And it's hysterical because I I had no idea. I mean, the interest rates did kind of what uh-huh. I expected. Yeah but worse, but we had no idea that that boat was going to go up 30% in value in one year. The price literally went up 30% in one year. And I just looked, I said, oh my God. I said, had we waited one year, we would have have said, no way, forget it. Yeah, it would have been out of our comfort zone, so to speak. So what happened then is, and we actually discovered Grand Dunes because of one of the breakdowns um, On on the 45. We broke down in... Georgetown. Georgetown. And we were in Georgetown for a week broken down and we finally got underway and we got underway a very late day. So we just pulled into Grand News because we needed a place to pull it. Like, wow, this place is really nice. And I started talking to some people looking at it. And then we discovered, I mean, it's, it's super protected. Like when yeah. you pull up, you look down on your boat when you're standing at the concrete where the cars park, it's that protected. And then it's, like I said, it's full floating use. So you can just tie the crap out of the boat. And, um, it's fresh water, perfect place to winter. We've been doing it so much that the places that we, there's places that are on limits and places that are off limits and places that are off limits are because of currents are ridiculous. Yeah. You know, there's no space to maneuver. So all the places that we stop are just super easy to get in and out of super safe. It doesn't matter how much wind, how much current, easy in and out, uh, plus fuel range. Plus there's some areas where there just isn't anything. You have to go so far. We always pick a week where it's a midday high tide. So you figure if you only draw, like the cruisers only draws three and a half feet. So if you have a four to six foot tidal change and you're running at high tide, <laughs> your chances of running aground are somewhere close to nil as long as you're where you're supposed yeah. to be. So she's very busy because even I'm running because she's looking how long till the next bridge so we can time it just right or what's coming up. Or even if we are going someplace we've never been, she'll call it up and look at it on Google Maps so or and show it to me so I understand. Because what we've learned is, you know, it it's not like a car. You can't just stop and get your wits about you. You can't just stop and say this. I mean, so I want to know before we go anywhere, I want to know, okay, where am I going? What 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 direction are the winds coming from? What's the current doing? Where are you putting me? So because uh-huh. if you're ready for it, it's not a problem. It's when you're confused and you don't understand what's going on and you got this ripping current or the wind's blowing, that's when things usually go to hell in a handbag fast. You know, on the one hand, you know, we often like those people don't know what they're doing and and it's kind of difficult, you know, to to be up because you got a lot of people who don't know what they're doing, but it's really has expanded boating. Oh, it's definitely you know, expanded. I mean, it's, it's expanded yeah. boating. It's allowed more people Which, to go boating. Um, like because, anything, it's a plus and a minus. Right. It's allowed a lot more people to do it, but it's also allowed a lot more people to get in trouble when because they don't know what the heck they're doing. Yeah. So, but back to the point about what we're talking about, that's another reason why we stick with with buying brands from Marine Max because obviously we're we bought six boats, several in aggregate, several million dollars worth of with boats and everywhere we've been taken good care of. And like I said, when you have a problem, it's important to have a dealer, a network. And it doesn't matter where I mean we've been at Marine Max is all over the place and literally we pulling in on one engine you know, and they're the one time they were literally standing in the on the pier with the Cummins mechanic waiting for us to pull in 
As yeah. soon as the lines are on, the Cummins mechanic jumps on board and runs down in the in the engine room. Um, yeah, for all the trouble that we had with that 45, you know, take- sedan bridge, I think it really did solidify our relationship with Marine Max, although, you know, poor TJ got yelled at, so to speak, <laughs> a lot, you know, with it, it, but really, you know, all of, you know, from, from you know, from New Jersey all the way down to Key West, you know, and, and yeah. Florida, we just have gotten very comfortable with Okay, if we have and even problem, if and even if you guys don't have a facility, they'll say, okay, these are the people to use in that area. That was in Beaufort when we yeah. I mean, we literally, I mean, I could tell you all the great though. We yeah. we literally pulled in and oh, we learned this lesson too. You don't check the engine room before you get underway when you're running, you check it when you pull in to decide if you're leaving the next day or not. Aha. Uh-huh. So we learned that lesson the hard way. But anyway, the one breakdown we had left. Well, we left Grand Dunes. We went out at Little River Inlet and we went all the way up to Moorhead City. We even stayed out around Frying Pan Shoals. So we were out in the ocean for well over six hours. Um, and we pulled in, we tied up and I, and she's standing, we always hold our breath on that. And I went down below and I looked up or I said, we're not going anywhere tomorrow. Here, the one gear loop bottle was completely empty. Um, but anyway, it's kind of funny. So then we called TJ. So immediately, I mean, within an hour, people were there. Uh, they came and the guy runs down the engine room. He comes up and he looks at me. He says, <laughs> "Here it was flooded, completely flooded out with sea- the whole port pod was completely flooded out with seawater. Blew all the gear lube into the engine room, the whole nine yard." He looks at me. He goes, "Where did you come from?" I said, "We came from Grand Dunes." I said, "We left a little." He goes, "You shouldn't even be here right now." Wow. So, do you have any further travel plans for Echo Sierra? I mean, we we've, we've actually, like yeah. I said, gone all the way down to Key West. Not that we don't want to do that again. Right. But I'd really like to go north. You yeah, know? what we're thinking is that hopefully this summer, maybe next summer, we'll make a trip up north or two. But now that our kids are here in the business, we figure within another year or two, once we have everything really turned over and they they have the presence, um, we'll spend a lot more time on winter time down, just running around. Like for example, what we figure we might do is like you know after Thanksgiving, run the boat down to Grand Dunes, then come home for, you know, till Christmas. Then after Christmas, go down, pick it up, and maybe go down to Florida, spend two weeks on it, get a marina, slip somewhere for a month, come home for a couple of weeks, then go back down, yeah. pick it up, spend two weeks on it, move it somewhere else, come home. That's what we what we want to want to do. We were going to start doing that, but like I said, then the when the COVID pandemic hit, I'm like, okay, I'm not doing that. That's just dumb. right. <laughs> Any thought about ever doing the Great Loop? It's interesting. I read two books on it. And honestly, after reading two books, I'm kind of less interested in doing it than before I read the two books. But I I still think we very well may do it just so we can do it. But there's a lot of that that's not fun, so to speak. There's a lot of it that's not fun. A lot of waiting. And like you said, you have to be, you have to plan, but you also have to be able to abandon your plan. And correct. And if we were going to do that, what we would do is we'd probably do like a month on the boat, leave it sit for somewhere, go home for a month, go back, pick it up, do another month, yeah, go home. Again. For a month. Yeah, that's how we would do. So we would probably do it like over a year or two is probably what we would do. Basically have no home port for a year or two. Right. The one we have now certainly could do it because we could get under the bridge in Chicago. There's one bridge, I think it's 18 foot max or 16 foot or something like that, that you have to be able to get under. Right. So, so you have to hit the tides correctly and Oh, uh, you can't have a fly bridge. <laughs> oh, you can't yeah. yeah. Yeah, you you have to have a coop because if you you either have to have sailboats step their mast or some boats even with bridges can partially disassemble and get underneath or whatever have you, but we wouldn't have to because we could get under it. So the boat we have now could do the could do the loop. Yeah, we Very- we interviewed a uh, a couple that had a catamaran. They have an Aquila catamaran and they've done the great loop twice. And they talked about, you know, the the ups and downs and just the people they met and they, they loved it. They thought it was a great, great adventure. You know, it's just the two of them. They can work from their boat. So they did. Once the kids are up and running, that's what we can do. We can provide, we can work from the boat. We do now. We like when we're, even though we're going to be moving it the next week, we'll still, we come back to practically nothing. Cause when you pull in, you set up, you catch up on your emails, you do all your, we have a full blown office on board. We got fax printer, copy scanner. Oh my gosh the whole nine yards so but yeah that's kind of what we're really doing so our daughter like I said our, they're both naval academy grads she's a nuclear submariner 
And so she's very, very technically competent. And um, he was a surface warfare. He's actually going to completely take over our sales department in a few years. She actually got accepted to Wharton's MBA program. So oh, wow. she starts this summer. So we figure when she finishes up her Wharton MBA, she'll have been here about two and a half to three years. So it'll be ready to, 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 to step down and let her take over the reins. Have you looked into the Marine Max vacation? So chartering the catamarans in the british virgin islands we're familiar with it um we've done quite a few of the getaways right and we and yeah. that's something that we have tossed around a little bit you know? yeah so you got to plan it a year out is what you got to do because i did that i i've been with marine max for nine years and i've been i had never been on a marine max vacation for like personal so i took uh my right. my dad turned 70 last year i turned 40 and i was like we are going so we planned it and we went and it was my parents and then me and two of my friends and it was perfect. It was, it was, the group was perfect. We all got along. We had our itinerary and we went and it's just one of those experiences where it's just everywhere you look is gorgeous. And we, yeah. we had a captain, we, we got a captain to go with us and because we, we don't have the experience to really be, you know, piloting a 54 foot catamaran around and we wanted to have cocktails and not worry about it. And we <laughs> yeah, also exactly. really liked his local knowledge, just having him aboard was awesome. So I don't know, I cool. put that on the bucket list, the anniversary list. Well, I wish you both the best and can't wait to see where the journey takes you. If you end up buying another boat, we'll have to redo this interview and talk about <laughs> the, you know, the addition and why. And I think it's interesting for people to, to hear these kind of stories when they're looking at boats for the first time is... Like you said, it's trial by error. You're, you may not get the perfect boat the first time you'll, you learn almost like what you do and don't like, and it's, you just got to find it. Thank you both very much. I, I feel like we could talk boating forever. So <laughs> I, I, you have such a wealth of knowledge, uh, your backgrounds, of course, and your boating experience just in the recreational side of it too. So thank you so much for sharing your stories and thank you so much for your family service. I've really, that's quite amazing. And I wish you well on your journey from, you know, back up north. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Hopefully knock on wood all goes safe. <laughs> yeah, secure, secure everything. Take it all off, <laughs> secure it all. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for everything you guys do for us. We really appreciate it. Yes, you're welcome. Boating is awesome. Thank you to our guests and for you for joining us today. Subscribe, follow, and hit that five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform to stay up to date on all things boating. Land comprises 29% of the Earth's surface. We're focused on the other 71%. We hope you enjoyed today's boating broadcast. As always, stay healthy and boat happy. I'm Lisa Harrison, and we'll see you next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of From the Helm Boating Broadcast. To keep up with the latest news and notes in the world of boats, be sure to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and wherever podcasts can be heard. Until next time, we'll see you out on the water. <laughs>